Good evening, everybody. As you know, Royal Pearl Hospital has always strived to be very academic and also always strived to teach everybody in and around the world and uh, bring the best of the best in every field. Now, we with Alambic have started on a very new mission. And this mission is called Meeting the Legends on a Saturday Night. I'm sure on a Saturday night, everybody will be in a different mood. But then, let us have some really academic stuff going on on maybe every fortnight on Saturday nights at 8 o'clock. So we're going to have a small video by Alambic. And I really thank Alambic for having uh, done this program with us. And uh, they, you know, have got a very good name in doing the master class. So we are also bringing a series of master classes with Royal Pearl Hospital this year. And also a series of Meet the Legends. So we'll have the video of Alambic and then I will come back to you again soon. Good evening, doctors. Myself, Rajit Kumar, Vice President, Alambic. Today, I take this opportunity to welcome all of you for this great scientific feast. Connect with the legends. Being a knowledge-driven global pharmaceutical company, at Alambic, our mission is to provide access to every practitioner and a specialist of the best minds in knowledge and the best hands at surgery in an endeavor to continuously build new avenues for knowledge. Dissemination, today we, under the able guidance of Dr. Janaki Ram, open digital doors powered by Alembic as means to gain knowledge and connect with the legends of the internal ENT fraternity. Today at Royal Pearl Hospital, Trichy, Dr. Janaki Ram is hosting Dr. Jay Kumar Menon. His stature is such which does not need any introduction. The day which we have chosen purposefully for all of you to log in, sit back, relax and be a part of the knowledge dissemination at its highest level involving legends of their area of expertise and specialization. Once again doctors, I welcome all of you for this great scientific event. Thank you very much. So as you saw, Alambic and uh, Royal Pearl has now joined hand and this year is going to be full of academics. To start with Meet with the Legends on a Saturday night, we have none other than the real legend in uh, laryngology and he is none other than Dr. Jai Kumar Menon. And he doesn't need any introduction, he is a very world renowned personality and he is the teacher of teachers in the field of laryngology uh, in this part of the world. He is actually a very dynamic and a very humble, a very nice person to move with, a very nice human being as well as an encyclopedia of knowledge in laryngology. In fact, I learned all my basics in laryngology from Dr. Jack Marmena. He is one of the few in the country who is having a solitary laryngology practice. It's, it's really proud to say that. I mean, he has got a dedicated department of laryngology in which five doctors are working round the clock to treat uh, various you know, problems in laryngology like airway, a voice, deglutition and uh, so on. So without much ado, we will start this Saturday night with uh, Dr. Jack Menon, sir, welcome to uh, Trichy, welcome to Royal Pearl, sir. And Thank we are just eagerly waiting to hear your lecture. And the whole world is waiting for you. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Janaki Ram. Uh, good evening, all of you.
Dr. Janakaram is a very good friend of mine and, and I wish all success for this uh, wonderful uh, teaching project uh, he has undertaken and uh, I am sure that he will continue with this for long, long time even though I should say that I do not have any pretension of being a legend in laryngology that is uh, certainly not the case. I, I consider myself uh, still a beginner, I ask anybody who has gone into the any super specialty they know that you know I also have known that the more you learn the more you understand that you have to learn still more and more. So, it is an unending process. So, I am only happy to share my experiences in laryngology and if it is going to be useful to you I will be more than happy. So, with this introduction we will uh, go into the field of laryngology. Today we have selected three topics. The first topic is diagnosing laryngeal lesions and the second will be on the vocal cord paralysis and the last one will be on neurological dysphagia. So, we will start with the first topic uh, that is diagnosing laryngeal lesions. We will start with the slide show now. I think uh, most of you know uh, who is this personality. Uh, this is Manuel Garcia who was actually a musician and then later became a voice trainer and out of curiosity he actually designed a very ingenious technique of watching or examining the larynx. So, that is how the first indirect laryngoscopy came into practice. Since then so much of advances has happened in the diagnosis of laryngeal lesions and that is going to be our topic. Now, even the uh, first year postgraduate know that the basic examination uh, technique for visualizing the larynx is the laryngeal mirror. But now, this is being less and less used even though it has got some advantage like it is a very inexpensive thing. Uh, uh, the color uh, contrast is perfect, but the problem is that there is no magnification and it is a fleeting view. You know, you do not you do not get real continuous picture to diagnose uh, various laryngeal lesions and uh, uh, especially it is not possible to do the laryngoscopy, indirect laryngoscopy in everybody. Some patient may be really, really uh, very uh, have a very sensitive throat. So, in that case you may not be able to do the la indirect laryng laryngoscopy however skilled you may be. So, nowadays predominant uh, techniques of visualization of the larynx is by using the telescopes either the rigid or the flexible or ideally both. Actually you should be having both in the ideal scenario you should be having both a rigid and flexible laryngoscope. Rigid is always superior in the clarity even, uh, even if you take into consideration the chip on tip camera and hence they are best for identifying even the minutest of structural lesions. But flexible laryngoscopy has got some advantages over rigid scopy especially when you are dealing with a movement problem of the vocal cords. So, neurolaryngology conditions like vocal cord paralysis, tremors, spasmodic dysphonias and of course, the muscle tension dysphonia where structurally there is nothing wrong with the vocal cords, but functionally they are abnormal. So, for these two conditions certainly flexible laryngoscopy is superior, but ideally you should have both and many patients may require both of them. It all depends upon the, the, the individual cases and the individual patient whether you are able to see it properly. So, you will have to take the decision. Now, the rigid scopy there are many angles, but the most comfortable angle will be the 70 degree scopy even though 90 degree scopy are also used 70 degree is the most convenient scope. So, if somebody is just planning to buy a single scope rigid scope then you should be buying a 70 degree scope. 
you can use the classical 4 mm uh, nasal endoscopes too, but you need better magnification in the larynx. So, ideal scenario will be a 10 mm 70 degree rigid scope that is the best scope for the laryngeal visualization. Now, with that basic introduction, we will see a uh, lot of structural lesions, some of them are fairly very common, some of them are uncommon and some of them are very rare. And also in the end, we will uh, see few of the movement disorders, especially the neurolaryngologic and muscle tension dysphonia cases. So, we will start with the vocal nodule, which is probably the, uh, the, the most common condition uh, in, in, in a voice clinic. Can you play on that, that uh, thing? So, this is the vocal nodule classically. Uh, so, you can see that uh, the two nodules. Usually they are, symmetrical. this is little bit unusual in the, in the sense that they are little bit asymmetrical on the right vocal cord it is slightly posterior on the left vocal cord it is anterior. That is uh, nothing unusual about it, it can happen depending upon the, the, the tension the patient is keeping on the vocal cord on. But this is probably the most common condition in a laryngology clinic. Now, can click again. The vocal cord polyp is the second uh, probably the most common condition. It is a little bit different while vocal nodule is always bilateral condition, vocal cord polyps are unilateral and uh, you can also see this is a reddish polyp. It usually is an organized hemorrhage. This usually happens in adults who shout at the top of their voice and Compared to vocal nodule, this is very rare in a chin children and in ladies. Vocal cord cyst will be the, probably the third most common condition, but it produces probably the maximum hoarseness among the Reinke space lesion. The reason is that you can play on that. Uh, the lesion, is, the reason is that the vocal, while the vocal cord polyp and nodule are it can be considered as an extension of the Reinke space. Here, the vocal cord cyst is actually containing liquid. So, and you just got the different vibrating properties. So, you can see that there hardly any vibration over the cyst and it really produces a very unpleasant rough voice. That is typical of a vocal cord cyst. Reinke sedima is uh, luckily coming uh, less and less in our, you can play, you can play, uh, 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 in our, our country because I think uh, smoking is not that common among the younger generation here. You can see that both vocal cords are massively edematous. Uh, so, the commonest cause is smoking. Of course, it can also occur in hypothyroidism and in, uh, in, 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 uh, in uh, severe laryngopharyngeal reflux. But the classical, this kind of uh, waterlogged masses occur mainly in smokers only. So, this is a typical finding. So, all these conditions now we have shown a very typical telltale, telltale diagnosis. You can pick up the vocal nodule, the, the, the polyp, the cyst, the ring is edema. Now, papilloma, uh, you can play, is uh, continues to be a real thorn in the flesh for the laryngologist despite all the tremendous advances in the, in the field of laryngology. It, it's a, it can be a real frustrating condition. You can see the like grape like masses involving practically a, any part of the larynx can be involved. Here you can see it is on the left vocal cord mainly, but also on the right vocal cord subglottis. It can go to the supraglottis, trachea, bronchi. It can be a nasty condition. Even though it is basically a benign disease, it can many times behave just like a malignant condition. So, a very, very difficult condition to treat. Even now, we do not have the final answer to correct this condition. Malignancy, unfortunately, is still not that rare in uh, India. Uh, this is actually a very surprising case. This was a 27 year old lady, which uh, uh, ladies are very unlikely to get laryngeal malignancies. But 
nowadays we are seeing probably little more cases may be because of the influence of the hpv even teetotal aids are getting but uh, as in case of rengi's edema malignancy also is far more common in in uh, smokers now this is a con the when the next two condition we are discussing is uh, congenital this is the glottic web you can see anteriorly the vocal cords are fused together and luckily the most of these webs are uh, not uh, that serious the only problem with the child will be you can play once again uh, a high pitch sound very rarely they produce a, a airway obstruction if they do produce airway obstruction they are uh, emergency they need to be treated much earlier than that otherwise if it is a purely a voice problem we can very well wait up to the age of 2 or 3 years and then only you need to operate now sulcus is a new relatively new diagnosis in laryngology only when the larynx uh, laryngology developed as a specialty this existence was known you can see that the medial margin of the both vocal cords are scarred and hardly any mucosal waves are there very little mucosal wave anteriorly very little mucosal wave posteriorly and you can hear that voice the classical high pitch breathy strain voice is typical of sulcus we don't know the cause but it is much commoner in asia than in europe and america probably india has got a very very high incidence of sulcus vocalis we really don't know how what is the etiopathogenesis of it vast majority 90 more than 95% of them are congenital so there is some problem with the development of the rengi space now this is vocal process granuloma not a rare condition again you can see on the right side here uh there is a pro polypoidal mass just medial to the vocal process the good thing about this is that it is very exceedingly rare uh, for that area to develop a malignancy so people who are not familiar with this condition might even think about that being a malignancy but vocal process region is very 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 extremely rarely only develop vocal process uh, malignancy of that region so this is a classical vocal process granuloma can you play that once again this is usually secondary to a, a wrong style of voice production where the person has got a, too much of force on voice production and if it is coupled with laryngopharyngeal reflux which is fairly common the mucosa become highly inflammable and due to the persistent forcible contact a some grade of muc perichondritis develop secondary to that patient develop vocal process granuloma since it is in the posterior part very rarely only patient have significant voice problem now this is a very very common diagnosis prob- probably even over diagnosis you can play that this is the laryngopharyngeal reflux disorder there are many classical sign but this is the most important sign if you watch carefully you can see there is a protuberant mass between the arytenoid that is the inter arytenoid pachydermia almost it look like a polyp why i am showing this picture is that if people are not familiar with this condition they might think this is a posterior glottic polyp and even might attempting to remove it nothing can be more dangerous because that is a very very important area if you traumatize if by doing a surgery in the inter arytenoid region that will invariably end up in a condition known as the posterior glottic stenosis which require a far more difficult surgery is to correct so if you see a finding like this be sure that it is most likely inter arytenoid pachydermia secondary to constant bathing of the arytenoid region from the acid so usually they respond very well to the pando the proton pump inhibitors and anti pepsin agents submucosal hemorrhage is not a rare no go back go okay play on it yeah you can see that the right compare the color of the left vocal cord and the right vocal cord the right vocal cord has got very bright red color in the vocal process region and near the anterior commissure and in between there is some yellowish color that is an old hemorrhage the red color is the fresh hemorrhage this usually happens if somebody shouts at the top of their voice and also it can 
happen in ladies during their premenstrual period during the premenstrual period because of the effect of the progesterone the vocal cord become waterlogged and the chance of capillary tear and bleeding is high this is one condition which require absolute voice rest because if the if the voice is being continuously used the vocal cord hemorrhage can easily become a vocal cord polyp further requiring surgery this people may not be very familiar so many of the lesions you still use so are very familiar to most of you this is what is known as the capillary ectasia watch the superior surface of the left vocal cord so varicose vein like structure structure actually we like because veins of the vocal cord it's only the difference is that it is actually not a vein but it is a capillary the so people who really strain at their voice can develop many time this kind of tortuous capillaries tortuous uh, blood vessels on the superior surface mind you this is not on the medial margin so generally these people won't have much of a voice problem but their main complaint will be easy fatigability and the danger is that they can bleed at any time resulting in a hemorrhage so may, even though they are asymptomatic if it is really big they are better treated by laser cauterization now tuberculosis is still uh, not very rare in india actually on the other hand it is on the resurgence so there are many cases of multi drug resistant uh, tuberculosis and this is a classical finding of tuberculosis laryngitis nowadays that is a monocorditis you can see that right vocal cord is normal but the left vocal cord is a reddish slightly granular and irregular if you examine it under microscope you can even see the granular nature of that lesion this is almost typical of the uh, the tuberculous laryngitis stroboscopy shows uh, some amount of mucosal wave but it is still reduced when compared to the uh, to the normal side there are other kind other uh, signs like turban epiglottis multiple ulceration but they are nowadays very rarely seen so a unique monocorditis unilateral congestion of the vocal cord if you come across especially in the absence of a, a, a scenario suggestive of submucosal hemorrhage you should strongly suspect tuberculosis and do the basic investigation to rule out most of them are secondary to laryngeal uh, pulmonary tuberculosis sometimes you can have primary uh, laryngeal tuberculosis to in that case you may have to take the patient to the theater do a submucosal biopsy now whenever you see an unusual type of mass very smooth mass always keep the diagnosis of amyloidosis in your mind amyloidosis is certainly not that rare so this kind of this look like a polyp but i uh, you know we knew that that is not the classical polyp and amyloidosis can present anywhere in the larynx it can be in the subglottis it can be in the glottis it can be in the supraglottis so the, a smooth surface unusual mass especially if there is an yellowish ten, a color then you should think that uh, uh, the, it, it could be amyloidosis this was a supraglottic amyloidosis you can see that there is a big mass on the right side supraglottis the important thing in keeping uh, making the diagnosis is that unless you write down the clinical diagnosis as amyloidosis the pathologist will not many time do the specific test for the amyloidosis and the diagnosis will be missed so any suspicious smooth surface lesions especially if there is an yellowish tinge always think of the possibility of amyloidosis sir uh, uh, yes uh, i have a uh, few queries actually let us make it more interactive okay because uh, let the uh, people also ask questions Sure. we have uh, a few questions one from dr rajendran dinesh kumar yeah. uh, good evening sir unilateral vocal cord granuloma how long would you manage medically with ppi and when would you contemplate surgery vocal process granuloma uh, you should treat adequately with proton bomb inhibitors for at least 6 weeks and uh, also they should be counseled regarding the voice usage what if your diagnosis is very sure there is no need of surgery you can actually give botox because botox is the treatment 
the vocal process granuloma is actually secondary to a perichondritis and one, if you want to perichondritis to subside you have to give absolute voice rest so you give botox to both thyroid muscle and in 2 to 3 weeks time you will see that the, the vocal process granuloma totally disappear so one more question by dr uh, loknath sahu what causes granuloma most common in your practice and uh, who you treat in case of WHO you treat in case of tuberculosis. So, what is the common cause of granuloma you have found in your practice? I, I suppose he is asking about the vocal process granuloma. Yes, yes. Vocal process granuloma, there are two major factors. Which is the major? We are not very sure. But the two major factors, one is the continuous bathing of the laryngeal mucosa by the acid so that it becomes very inflamed and fragile. And the second is the style of talking. People who speak in a much lower pitch has got the tendency for the vocal process the vocal process of the arytenoids to hit against each other so already inflamed because of the acid reflux it became ulcerated and the cartilage get exposed the cartilage is very very submucosal there and constant hitting actually result in a small amount of perichondritis and that is the cause of granuloma and one more question from dr deepak dalmia uh, from bombay yeah. Uh, if HPE shows only giant cells and Langerhans cells but no AFB, can we start AKT? Um, so, that yeah. is a question. Yeah, that is a presumptive. You will have to discuss, you will have to discuss with the pathologist, you will have to discuss with the case and also with the pulmonologist. If there is no other uh, diagnosis there is, uh, and uh, there is uh, no conventional treatment is not curing, and if the ch chance of tuber, the other parameters of tuberculosis is high, then you will have to treat. I generally get an opinion from the pulmonologist too. So, if it is a soft granuloma, go ahead and treat as tuberculosis. Okay, one more question from D Dinesh Sharma. Can both vocal cords be involved in tubercular laryngitis? Certainly, there is no reason why it shouldn't be. But we actually don't know why it happens on one side. Maybe it is the position, maybe it is the... Uh, the position patient is assuming maybe it is the reason why one particular side is affected lower respiratory tract it is causing the bathing of the the, uh, the vocal cord if there is bilateral lesion there is nothing to suggest that it cannot be tuberculosis actually i myself have a case where there both vocal cords were involved you can carry on sir yeah now this is a very rare condition. Uh, I think in Kerala it is very high, but a laryngeal rhinospodius is exceedingly rare. Very few cases have been reported. This patient came with incredible strider. She couldn't sit, she couldn't stand. And you know, we were planning to do the tracheostomy uh, because she couldn't do any, she couldn't sit comfortably at all. But uh, then the anesthetist put down a laryngeal mask anesthesia and tried to control it. And through the laryngeal mask, I could pass the flexible laryngoscope and uh, to my surprise, I saw a huge mass of rhinospodium coming from the immediate subglottis, coming like a bowl valve. Each time patient was exhaling, that was coming out of the glottis and causing an obstruction. You can see it in a, a few seconds time. So that was causing a real trouble for the patient and actually we could do, we could do uh, uh, do the, uh, 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 the removal of the uh, 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 laryngeal uh, uh, mass uh, endoscopically itself. Uh, uh, you can see that, that actually we are going uh, with the uh, with the uh, flexible laryngoscope through the camera there, and uh, there was there was a fairly big mass uh, between the arytenoid, and without tracheostomy, actually we could remove it. We could. Uh, first decompress and then we could intubate uh, with a, uh, you can see that, that it was a fairly very big mass was an old video that is why that quality of that picture is still not very good but you can still see that that is fairly a huge mass each time coming out of the vocal cord massive rhinospodium almost completely obstructing uh, but we could remove it without a tracheostomy then put the laser tube and uh, completely laserized the pedicle which was in the anti uh, just below the anterior commissure and patient was actually discharged next day without any tracheostomy she is free of the disease now for more than five years so rhinospodium in in an area where rhinospodium is endemic you, and especially if patient had multiple rhinospodium operation in the nasal cavity 
you shouldn't be surprised if you see a lesion like in in the larynx you can actually get uh, rhinospodium of the larynx too so that is not rare but uh, where areas I, I don't think it is very common in the north india it is fairly common in kerala sri lanka and uh, other other parts of the south india so in this region you have to keep uh, that diagnosis also in the mind now you can occasionally get uh, 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 rare tumors this was a 12 year old girl who presented with persistent hoarseness and this was the finding you could see that the right vocal cord even is not normal in the infraglottis there was a swelling but the left vocal cord was totally abnormal it was swollen and spindle shape and i again thought maybe it was amyloidosis there was some yellowish thing so i kept in the mind but i excised it but it came back as a granular cell tumor which is actually a benign condition but little bit difficult to control so uh, she is right now okay i did operation only on one side waited for the area to heal and then went for the other side now this is a classical finding of laryngeal sarcoidosis if you haven't seen it once you have seen this picture you will not miss this diagnosis so the epiglottis will look like a tire exactly like a tire you know the hemi cut across the 3 o'clock to 9 o'clock position a semi circle you see that it is massive this is the classical finding of sarcoidosis of the the larynx you can see is classically the supraglottis will be involved there you can play once again that uh, the arytenoids the aryepiglottic folds they also can be uh, quite swollen and vocal cords you can actually get a glimpse they are normal you can see that that is normal but this, look at the arytenoid look at the epiglottis so thick and the patient's main symptom is like a hot potato voice otherwise ho it is not hoarseness but her main symptom was sleep apnea she couldn't actually sleep well so there are different treatment once you diagnose it you can actually do laser debulk it there is a surgery known as the pepper pot laryngoplasty like a pepper pot you puncture multiple pores into 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 the, into the epiglottis so it becomes shrunk and later and you can even do a partial epiglottectomy sir i have a question yeah. can i ask a question please yeah uh, one question from loknath sahu yeah. post op rhinosporidiosis how much dose of dapsone and how long uh you will give it uh we don't give dapsone anymore that is uh that was the previous practice right now we don't we don't remove it the best chance of cure for the rhinospodium is that you completely thoroughly excise it with the newer gadgets like coblator and laser actually that has become easier now the difficult cases are only those cases which were operated years back and who got multiple pedicles the newer cases especially coblator is a fan, fascinating equipment for that because it doesn't allow bleeding it is fairly it has got a big working area you can actually cauterize all around so first treatment is the best treatment we don't give taps on now uh there's one more question from arun dr arun uh, he says that he has operated on a case of uh, recurrent squamous papilloma of both vocal cords with laser following which he, they, he has developed a massive web aggressive web so what what will be your line of management in this case yeah first of all is prevention when when you when you get the papilloma it is always safer to operate on one side never go near the anterior commissure and operate on both side it will invariably develop a web so stage it you excise on one side completely and on the other side only the posterior half don't go near the anterior half wait for the epithelium to heal back that is around 2 to 3 weeks time take the patient again for the surgery and do it on the other side once web is formed the treatment uh, is decided depending upon the fact whether the condition is under control if papilloma is still active no point in dividing the web it is not going to cure once the papilloma is well under control maybe say 6 months or even 1 year no evidence of any recurrence then you can treat just like any other web you divide it you can put a keel there are a lot of techniques so one more question from uh, chiranjib das do you cauterize the base in case of rhinosporidiosis originating from vocal cord yeah i i use the laser because you cannot really use the cautery cautery is too damaging for the vocal cord and even uh, coblator you should be using the on the coble uh, on the glottis you can use it on the subglottis on the supraglottis vocal cord is too fragile a structure to stand the injury caused by a, a monopolar diathermy or a coblator you can use a bipolar laryngeal diathermy great 
but the ideal scenario will be the laser okay sir you can continue please now press by larynx as laryngology is fast developing this is becoming a hot topic if you can do face lift there is no reason why you can't do a, a voice lift you know older people they will come say that you know my voice is weaker you can see the vocal cord is atrophic there is a spindle shape phonetry gap you can see big ventricle because the vocal cord is atrophic very prominent vocal process and the, the vocal cords are not actually completely closing so various types of press by larynx you come across now people previously didn't know that they can be treated now we can actually treat we can bulk it we can do proper voice therapy we can give injections a lot of treatments are there even you can do thyroplasty so this is a quite a hot topic in in laryngology nowadays now we'll come to the flexible laryngoscope also I'm, i i this is just uh, showing i will be also showing in between the rigid scope now many people will have asked me that when i am starting a laryngology clinic or a voice clinic which instrument i should buy the, the first answer is that depending upon the budget most of the time the your budget may not be very great so what you should do is that you should buy a pediatric flexible laryngoscope why pediatric because with the pediatric you can do more not only pediatric scopy but also adult scopy and and rigid scope you can buy later now you know that the quality of the the second picture that uh, that is the chip on tip camera that gives a super quality it is almost as good as the rigid scopy so when you have your budget is allowing you to buy bigger equipment you can certainly buy the chip on tip but when your budget is very very limited and you want to start the clinic you, if you are going to buy you always buy a conventional flexible laryngoscope with a pediatric diameter something like a 3.2 uh, uh, milli- uh, 3.2 diameter and preferably without a suction channel because suction channel uh, takes away the cl- clarity many time uh so if most of the time you need only diagnosis but when you have got more money and more budgeting uh, facility you can buy all those instrument now where is the indication for the flexible laryngoscopy so uh, we told mainly it is the neurolaryngology and the muscle tension dystonia and dystonia what is neurolaryngology where there is problem with the uh, the, uh, the neurological uh, function of the uh, vocal cord so it can be a bilateral vocal cord palsy it can be a unilateral vocal cord palsy it can be a superior laryngeal palsy it can be a tremor it can be dysphonias so many condition you can see this is the bilateral cord palsy and see the glottic space how much is the glottic space why you should be doing a flexible laryngoscopy there is no harm in doing a rigid scope in these patient too but the problem is that sometimes not always sometimes the rigid scope might give wrong impression about the movement of the vocal cord so if the clinical picture and the symptom the endoscopy picture and the symptom does don't tell with each other then you should always think of doing a flexible laryngoscopy too otherwise no harm in doing a rigid scope in neurolaryngology also but when in doubt in neurolaryngology and muscle tension dystonia you have to do a flexible laryngoscopy in structural lesion there is no need to do a flexible laryngoscopy rigid scope gives excellent picture you are not bothered about much about the movement now unilateral vocal cord palsy you can play away again so you you have seen the uh, bilateral vocal cord palsy you can also see the unilateral vocal cord palsy how the each vocal cord is uh, moving there see that the right vocal cord is moving the left vocal cord is immobile but you can see that there is no significant arytenoid asymmetry when patient is speaking the arytenoids are fairly symmetrical that say that it has got uh, fairly very good voice and at the most patient is going to require only thyroplasty no arytenoid rotation so these things are probably better seen with the flexible laryngoscopy than with the rigid uh, laryngoscopy uh, you can act- also see the structural lesion with the flexible laryngoscopy no problem especially if you got a chip on tip that is great but of course rigid has got a much bigger diameter more number of fibers so quality will be always superior now this is again another uh, very important topic in laryngology previously we knew only about the vocal cord palsy now we know that there are many many cases where there is no complete paralysis but partial paralysis or what we call paresis 
So different kinds of vocal cord palsy can occur with the result that now the terminology itself is now changing because we don't know whether you should call it palsy or paresis or synkinesis. Vocal cord has got a high tendency for recurrent learning in regeneration resulting in you know un unwanted type of um, uh, neural anastomosis, abductor going to the adductor. So some amount of regeneration always happen. So there is a tendency now to uh, internationally to classify all this as impaired vocal fold mobility rather than palsy or paresis. But for the time being, we will just uh, continue with this only. Can you play that again? Now watch this finding, how you diagnose paresis. Sometimes it is very easy, sometimes it is not very easy. Here you can see that the right vocal cord is moving, left is not moving that well. How Sometimes it may be even subtle. So how will you then diagnose? If you see a phonetry gap, and you play once again now. If you see a phonetry gap and see one arytenoid moving across the midline, watch the left arytenoid meets across the midline. That means the left side is para, para, you know, partially paralyzed. So don't think that just because the left arytenoid is going across the midline, the right is paralyzed. It is actually the left side is paralyzed. Why? Because the interarytenoid has got bilateral nerve supply. The right is normal. It is powerful. It is actually pulling the left uh, arytenoid to the uh, to the normal side. That is why the arytenoid crosses over the midline to the normal side. Now, a, a very similar condition. Many times you see this condition overriding arytenoid. So people don't know whether this is normal or abnormal. Here you can see that the arytenoids are overriding, but vocal cords are meeting in the midline. There is nothing. Patient doesn't have any voice problem. If you see something like that, you take it as normal because 10% of the population is said to be having an overriding arytenoid. But watch the other overriding arytenoid on the other side. Now, here there is an O, the, it is just like the previous case, this is actually a paresis. You can see that the right arytenoid is crossing over the midline, but there is a phonetry gap. So this is actually a paresis. So when you see overriding arytenoid, you should think about the two possibilities. Some it may be normal, if there is a phonetry gap, you should understand the arytenoid on the paralyzed side will actually cross over the midline and especially if they have got hoarseness, you should think that it's a subtle vocal cord paresis. Vocal cord paresis can be a very, very difficult condition to diagnose for the inexperience, but I hope these two signs will help you in the future. If the arytenoid is crossing over the midline, that is due to the unopposed pull of the powerful arytenoid. It is like a tug of war. Imagine you are doing a tug of war from two group. One group does not have the good foothold. They are in the loose stand. What will happen? The, the people with the good foot stand will actually pull them to the, to the side. Same thing happens in vocal cord paresis. The stronger arytenoid will pull the weaker arytenoid to the, in the side. So that is a sign of vocal cord paresis. Question, a yeah. uh, couple of questions. Uh, Dr. Yogesh uh, yes, has asked, what is the common cause of sudden onset unilateral vocal cord palsy? Unexplained unilateral vocal cord palsy, uh, most of them end up as actually idiopathic, uh, vast majority. So the current theory is that they are viral. If there are centers where you can actually do a viral study, even they may not yield the, the desired result. But uh, what we have to do is that we have to rule out, we have to make sure that we are not missing any serious lesion. So any vocal cord palsy, unexplained unilateral vocal cord palsy should be scanned. The whole root of the recurrent laryngeal nerve should be scanned. So you should take a scan from skull base to sternal angle. Used vast majority of them are actually uh, idiopathic. They may be viral, but you should be very careful about mediastinal lesions too. Many of the mediastinal lesion can actually present with vocal cord palsy. Skull base lesion producing unilateral vocal cord palsy is not that common. Uh, one more question by Dr. Uh, Santosh Kumar Swain. Uh, is troboscopy compulsory for starting a voice clinic? Yeah, I was coming to that. You know, I, 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 even though I showed most of the picture as troboscopy, I actually was talking only about the flexible laryngoscopy and the rigid laryngoscopy. Stroboscopy is, can be only a late addition. You need, when you are starting your clinic, you don't have. You, I don't think you should buy a stroboscopy 
because they are important only in diagnosing the, the vibration pattern. So, there are certain conditions like sulcus vocalis, early malignancy, they are important, but I will advise any youngster do not bother much about the stroboscopy in the beginning make a very good uh, endoscopy so that you can get a very clear picture. So, we have one uh, just a comment that uh, we are being seen by 3961 people that is roughly 4000 people across the world great. and uh, it is a very great uh, number. I just want to ask one question by Dr. Praka Prakash Munka, my very close friend. Most of unilateral vocal cord palsies compensate and does not require any treatment. Your comments sir. In a vocal cord palsy, we are understanding it better and better. Now, we know that when the vocal cord get paralyzed, there is some amount of regeneration invariably happens. And the regeneration can actually go in different directions. Sometimes the adductor may be predominantly re uh, regenerated, sometimes the abductor may be regenerated. So, depending upon this, vocal cord can get fixed in new three positions. Sometimes it may be in adducted position, that means paralyzed vocal cord is in adducted position, the other vocal cord has no difficulty in meeting it at all. So, patient have near normal voice, they do not require any treatment. The second group, the paralyzed cord get fixed in neutral position, their voice will be little bit weak, maybe MPD around 8 second, but their voice will not be very bad and many time with voice therapy and positioning of the neck, you can actually improve the voice. But the third group, where the vocal cord get fixed in abduction, they have got very, very poor voice, they need surgery. And one point is that we have been talking for years that the other vocal cord compensate. There is nothing like that. Actually, the vocal cord really cannot come too much across the midline. It is what we thought as compensation is actually the final position of the regenerated vocal cord. You know, I told about being fixed in the adducted position. So, there is no, there is a limit for the opposite cord to cross over the midline, it cannot do that. So, that is the reason why some people do not require any surgery. So, that means uh, your conclusion is that there is nothing like uh, compensation at all, that there word is. should be removed. Yeah, right. Okay, thank you, carry on please. Now, this is a very, very rare condition, but uh, unless you are familiar with that, you will miss it. The, e press, can, the classical keyhole shape phonetic gap, this is an interarytenoid paralysis. And if you watch carefully, you can see there is a big gap between that arytenoid posteriorly. No, in, in now watch when you see the next video, watch that area. That will get completely close. The arytenoid will come close to each other. Here there is a big shallow yawning gap between the arytenoid. This is the interarytenoid paralysis. Again, very rare condition, very difficult condition to treat because there is no method as of now to correct the interarytenoid paralysis. You can fix one arytenoid, but you cannot fix both arytenoid. If you fix both arytenoid medially patient will have severe striders. You can see that classical triangular gap. This is a rare condition. Uh, uh, we do not know why some people have got interarytenoid paralysis because interarytenoid is quite unique in the sense that it has got a bilateral innervation. Now, superior laryngeal is again a subtle condition, very difficult to diagnose unless you are very familiar with that. Even a familiar people can actually get uh, uh, confused. One uh, important sign will be a relatively transverse areopiglottic fold. Watch the right areopiglottic fold is more anteroposterior while left is at an angle. You can see that while patient is actually producing sound on the high pitch sound, you can see that left left areopiglottic fold is getting more and more transverse. You can appreciate that now and the left vocal cord is bowed also. This is a very subtle sign. If it occur bilaterally, it can be very difficult because you can't compare you know, with the other side. You know that anybody who is familiar with a bilateral palatal paralysis, it is very difficult to diagnose. If it is a unilateral, you can always compare with the other side. Similarly, a unilateral superior laryngeal is relatively easy. The right is anteroposterior, left is transverse. Myasthenia gravis, uh, this is not the classical picture. Any case, any uh, bilateral paresis can present, but myasthenia also will present like that. They will have a fairly weak voice. And you can see that patient does not have any breathing difficulty, but the adduction is very, very poor. And they have got some swallowing problem also. You can see there is some amount of saliva in the pyriform fossa. See that plenty of saliva actually. 
her swallowing also is affected and you can see the bowed vocal cord the adduction is very very weak this is i will not say that this is the typical myasthenia gravis finding just like the previous slide but myasthenia mind you never always keep myasthenia also in your diagnosis when you come across unusual vocal cord paresis but you uh, they may be unilateral they may be bilateral and especially if it is combined with the swallowing problem you should strongly suspect uh, that condition sir i have a question from uh, dr r k ja uh, whether vocal cord polyps can be medically treated there is no medical treatment vocal cord polyp is actually a organized hemorrhage so but in the early stage when the vocal cord polyp is blood blood red very reddish if they take absolute voice rest they will actually resolve many of the smaller polyps will uh, resolve you can certainly give uh, ppa as well as some enzymatic preparations but i think the major role is absolute voice rest but very very few people can actually practice absolute voice rest for 2 weeks if they do very well so, so there is no harm there is always time vocal cord polyp is not a serious condition no harm in attempting a conservative management for 2 or 3 weeks if it uh, resolves well and good so we have a question from ranbir singh how often aspiration is a problem in vocal cord palsy how often unilateral vocal cord palsy recurrent laryngeal nerve palsy alone is very very unlikely to produce a, a, a aspiration i can put it this way now there are four major nerves related to swallowing glossopharyngeal hypoglossal superior laryngeal recurrent laryngeal so unless there is more than one nerve involved aspiration will not generally happen so if it is a combined high vagal palsy chances of aspiration is high because superior laryngeal is gone recurrent laryngeal nerve is gone if there is a hypoglossal palsy with a recurrent laryngeal nerve palsy chance of aspiration is there isolated recurrent laryngeal nerve palsy hardly ever produce even if it produces maybe post thyroidectomy one or two days they may have some a cough during a uh, water intake but generally they won't so uh, just a comment uh, more than 5100 people are watching it uh, i am just want to tell you that uh, there are so many questions pouring in i am we may not be able to answer all the questions we will try to answer most of your questions over to uh, dr jack mar sir now now spasmodic dysphonia is not a rare condition at all but important thing is that unless you know about you won't diagnose it you don't require uh, stroboscopy you don't require actually anything a very a exp you can see that, that this is a tremor with uh, spasm but towards the end you can see the classical spasm that is a spasm in between he is going so in between you can see that is this that again spasm in between you can see that that's a classical adductor spasmodic dysphonia but i will tell you let me tell that the most important diagnostic tool is an experienced uh, person only if you have heard layer spasmodic dysphonia early you will diagnose otherwise whatever equipment you have got you will not diagnose it that is very important so uh, if you have heard the spasmodic dysphonia it is not very difficult when you do the scopy you will see that in between there is spastic hyperadduction that is a classical adductor spasmodic dysphonia abductor spasmodic dysphonia is much rarer here you actually in, instead of adduction in between you see lot of abduction see that but hardly ever the vocal cord completely closed that is all abductor spasm see that even when patient is producing the sound there is some amount of uh, gap between the membranous vocal cord that is the abductor classical abductor spasm of abductor spasmodic dysphonia uh, it is not that easy to diagnose uh, abductor spasmodic dysphonia unless you know it of course i myself have uh, 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 described a sign which is uh, invariably present in all case of abductor spasmodic dysphonia at the time of abductor spasmodic dysphonia patient will have flaring of lnsa that is a very very almost always present sign uh, but since it is an endoscopy finding i am not showing it here now it is very similar to adductor spasmodic dysphonia but watch the difference in laryngeal tremor the whole larynx shakes you can see that it is not just vocal cord the epiglottis the arytenoid the aryepiglottic fold the pharynx everything is shaking otherwise uh, voice wise sometimes if you are not experienced you may think that this is a ductor spasmodic dysphonia 
this is actually laryngeal tremor the whole bo- uh, the larynx is t- uh, tremulous and many of them will have even tremors of the hand and all so uh, the, the uh, uh, if you see this finding you should make sure that this is vocal tremor of course both can be treated with the botox now coming a few words about the muscle tension dystonia means vocal cords are normal so what is a normal phonation there are three requisites there shouldn't be any phonatory gap there shouldn't be any supraglottic phenomena that means neither the ventricular band nor the arytenoid come and the aryepiglottic fold should form a pointed arch can you play once again say that absolutely no phonatory gap no ventricular band reduction and look at the aryepiglottic fold point v pointed v this is the classical normal definition of a, a normal phonation now you can get different types there is classification like type 1 type 2 but what i am just telling is descriptive terminology this is the ventricular band reduction he is actually a kathakali singer you can see as he go to the high pitch he go for unbearable ventricular band tension totally obstructing the view of the vocal cord this is severe ventricular band dystonia so that is why again it is better you do a flexible laryngoscopy rather than a rigid rigid rigid, rigid scope each time patient sing for the high pitch it simply go over reduction of the ventricular band that is a classical ventricular band dystonia many singers will have this kind of problem now you can have another muscle tension dystonia known as the anteroposterior compression especially people who want to speak in a much lower pitch i uh, love bass voice watch this will be the finding each time patient phonate the arytenoid come much closer to the epiglottis so that you can see only at least half or even one third of the vocal cord only rest of the vocal cord is not visualized this uh, this is not very common in india but this is much more common in western world where you know even low pitch uh, breathy voice is considered very attractive for the ladies in india we don't consider that kind of voice that attractive so probably they don't develop that but in western country type 3 this is known as the type 3 muscle tension dystonia or anteroposterior compre- compression so we have a question from dr ritesh sir can we uh, take the question yeah please uh, best ppi in your experience i think if you and ask i have i myself have asked this question to many gastroenterologists i don't think there is any any real answer they all are good they are probably uh, very good i use uh, uh, pandoprazole 40 mg twice daily for 6 weeks and once the situation is under control i actually shift to rabiprazole once daily because it is a sl- uh it has got a relatively longer duration of action but there are many gastroenterologists who prefer uh, somiprazole and omeprazole i think there are no studies saying that one is superior so that is uh, from dr ritesh uh, another question from dr anil reddy uh, he is a beginner and he would like to know if 70 degree endoscope or 90 degree rigid laryngoscope is uh, better 70. or a flexible one is better than both 70 is easier 70 is easier but I, i told in the beginning for the when you are starting a clinic by the flexible that is easier so you can see every patient with that rigid scope you can't do it in everybody in a child you can't do that so when you are when your practice is beginning by a pediatric flexible laryngoscope when you are buying a rigid scope by a 70 degree and uh, one more question by dr h ravi kishore ba balari karnataka reason concept about phonatory gap phonatory gap can be due to a structural problem it can be due to a functional problem structural problem means the vocal cord is atrophic so it can be due to sulcus vocalis it can be due to vocal cord atrophy secondary to infection it can be secondary to presbyolarynx functional causes will be where the vocal cord is bowed so the classical will be superior laryngeal nerve palsy then the finding we just now saw the anteroposterior compression when the anterior and posterior ends of the vocal cord come closer to each other the vocal cord bow so there is a phonatory gap and in abductor spasmodic dysphonia so you have got both structural and functional cause phonatory gap is not a diagnosis it is a finding you have to identify why that phonatory gap occurred and then treat so uh, dr city uh, she is from uh, in, uh, indonesia she came here for a training she says that uh, 
um this is a very useful and a very nice uh, lecture and it should yeah. be there always uh, on the facebook yes definitely we will do it dr city now over to dr jay kumar please now puberphonia is again very very common in 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 india especially in south india kerala it is very common when where, where i had my laryngology training in in ireland where hardly in the western world it is very rare it is much common in india you can see that, that this is a classical picture normal vocal cord but a falsetto mode it never actually totally touches so a sort of a parallel phonetry gap and very high pitch voice can you play once again and we'll have a very high pitch voice so when you get a high pitch voice in a male the only other diagnosis you have to rule out is a sulcus vocalis because sulcus can produce but here you can see that the medial margins are very sharp but it is not it is always moving in the falsetto mode now uh, this is a huge topic but because of the time problem i am just stopping with one slide the no people can have normal speaking voice abnormal singing voice that is the most common complaint singer will tell that now when i speak my my voice is okay but when i sing i have got all kind of problem so patient can have muscle tension dysphonia all the muscle tension dysphonia like ventricular band dysphonia andropausal compression when they are sing only so that condition is known as dysodia that means singing voice is abnormal and you can get even other finding watch this she is a very fairly very famous singer from kerala when she sing high pitch you can see the piriform fossa is squeezing so this is known as the pharyngeal squeeze see normally you should be seeing that is abnormal when she is producing high pitch you can see that her piriform fossa get obliterated that shouldn't be the case when when, when you are singing high pitch if you are obliterating the piriform fossa then patient won't be able to produce you know much finer subtle changes of the vocal cords that is very difficult that is what they call sangadis and plants and things you know that 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 they cannot do that so this is known as the pharyngeal squeeze see that when she is going for the high pitch that's a bad that's a wrong technique see that again they squeeze so this is the classical pharyngeal squeeze this is a type of dysodia there are lots of abnormalities in in singing voice we cannot go for that that is a huge topic i, uh, for, I uh, that uh, that alone may take even one hour finally occasionally you may be forced to do an examination under anesthesia this is very rare when your diagnosis even with the rigid or the flexible laryngoscopy is not very sure very very rarely you may have to do an examination under anesthesia of course this uh, this tend out to be only a papilloma grape like lesion but usually you can diagnose almost all laryngeal lesion with a flexible laryngoscopy and rigid scopy if you have got stroboscopy great because you can study the mucosal wave pattern occasionally only you need to do the examination under anesthesia so yes in essence it is actually you no know, you should know ears won't hear and eyes won't see what brain does in know so first of all you have to teach your brain this condition is there if you are not familiar with spasmodic dysphonia you will not diagnose however in uh, better instruments you may have so it is like home told pay major attention to minor details minor attention to major details vocal cord polyp everybody will pick up in a huge vocal cord polyp it is not an issue at all but only if you look into a very very carefully you will find a small lesion like a small sulcus or a capillary ectasia so always cultivate that habit of studying the laryngoscopy finding again and again so later you will become a very very good clinician thank you so uh, you saw a very brilliant uh, lecture the, that was the first of the uh, three lectures of today and uh, in fact we have been seen by around uh, 7000 viewers all around the world so really a great uh, program dr jack very kumar nice, sir very nice very nice and, to hear uh, that and 7000 uh, people are watching you and now we'll go to the second topic uh, without much delay and that uh, topic will be taken over by dr jack kumar menon again and we are ready to answer a few of your questions because uh, we can't answer all of them because there are so many coming in and uh, over to dr jack kumar menon on vocal cord palsy 
now we go to the topic of vocal cord palsy again a much much bigger topic uh, but what we are going to do is that we are going to cover both the unilateral and bilateral this is uh, the K uh, kerala institute of medical science in trivandrum where i work where we have got the laryngology department now uh, in the previous lecture i told that nowadays we call it impaired vocal fold movement rather than vocal cord palsy it is the better terminology because occasionally the Im the immobile vocal cord may be due to a cricoretinoid joint dislocation a subluxation ankylosis interarytenoid ankylosis lot of things can happen so when you see a immobile vocal cord you can actually call it only immobile vocal cord you need further investigation to definitely tell that this is actually a joint problem or a, a neurological problem now unilateral uh, vocal fold movement uh, idiopathic vocal fold mo uh, movement problem so what you do is just like in any other case take a detailed history a special emphasis on the onset whether it was gradual or sudden we described early you know the sudden onset and also ask whether it is a progressive or non progressive progressive means some some lesion is going on so that is very important and uh, and always ask about the past history of head and neck surgery cervical spine surgery ct surgery uh, cardiothoracic surgery uh, intubation and ventilation systemic disease like uh, diabetic mellitus and rheumatoid arthritis this was a patient who actually underwent cholecystectomy and after surgery he came out with vocal cord uh, immobile vocal cord so that that is not rare this is actually described after general anesthesia sometimes over inflation of the bulb of the endotracheal bulb can actually cause tearing shearing force on the tracheoesophageal groove and can actually produce vocal cord paresis luckily they are temporary they can actually recover but also after general anesthesia it is not very rare to have a vocal cord arytenoid dislocation so be careful about that too now uh um unilateral vocal fold uh, that uh, i is instead of l that is a wrong mistake and uh, printing anyway never miss the basic investigation like x ray chest you know these are the two cases where actually we uh, the the clinician the miss the diagnosis the first is was actually a tracheal leomyoma producing uh, compression on the nerve and producing a vocal cord palsy he was she was being treated as asthma and the second was actually an intractable cough and vocal cord palsy patient had lymphoma so never forget to take very basic investigation you should always do that now laryngeal emg in the ideal center to check whether it is a paralysis or if it is a, a cricoarytenoid joint fixity i generally don't do that because i, I, I do a, a, a laryngeal electromyography as a therapeutic measure only diagnostically i am not doing much but there are many european centers where they do routine electromyo diagnosis also so how will you diagnose then what you should do is that this is a very important thing this everybody can do you do an examination under anesthesia and check both interarytenoid you can click that so check both interarytenoid and crico see that i am actually pressing the cricoarytenoid joint normally the it joint should move like that in a cricoarytenoid ankylosis that movement won't be there so put a blunt instrument behind the arytenoid and he, and just no go back and now play it. second one this is checking for the interarytenoid plate playing uh, checking for the interarytenoid so push one arytenoid away if there is a posterior glottis stenosis the other vocal cord will follow you so that means there is a stenosis on the interarytenoid region or a posterior glottis stenosis they also will present as an immobile vocal cord so you should learn how to palpate the cricoarytenoid joint as well as the interarytenoid region so that you don't actually miss a diagnosis of joint problem rather than a vocal cord paralysis now how you treat uh, most of the paralysis paresis first of course you make sure that everything is fine uh, there is no obvious lesion you have to take a ct scan and you have to rule out a lesion 
if uh, you can there is no harm in giving neurotropic agents and if uh, there is no harm in giving steroid either even though there are no controlled studies uh, saying that in vocal cord paralysis the steroid actually improve there are a lot of voice therapy techniques but mind you voice therapy is going to be successful only if the phonatory gap is small if the phonatory gap is very big say like the vocal cord the paralyzed vocal cord is in abducted position if you try voice therapy many patient will actually try lot of effort ultimately they will develop ventricular band voice which can be far more difficult condition to correct even after a thyroplasty so this is very important not only for the clean the otolaryngologist but also for the voice pathologist many people believe that every case can be actually treated by voice therapy no if the gap is very big the role of voice therapist is preventing abnormal compensatory strategies like you know straining at the vocal cords straining at the, the arytenoid so that shouldn't be done but if the gap is very small many times the result can be uh, dramatic can you put the first slide top slide this is just a restructuring you know uh, this was only a vocal cord paresis hardly any voice it was actually not due to the gap because many vocal cord paresis sometimes they themselves develop abnormal compensatory status and produce bad voice second slide can you click the second slide no no the second one no no go back the middle one the middle one ah yeah now this is known as the half swallow boom technique where you ask the patient to keep water in the mouth and then keep on gurgling sound the basis of this concept is that patient learn to elevate the larynx you can see that larynx going up and the laryngeal biomechanics is such that when the larynx is high up in the neck vocal cords come closer to each other so small phonatory gap can be easily corrected by this technique now the final slide the same patient actually one hour after voice therapy you can see that previously he didn't have any voice now hardly any any problem so but mind you this will work only in a small phonatory gap not in bigger bigger gap now what is the management surgical if there is a paralysis or a paresis you can actually immediately do endo uh, injection laryngoplasty this is one of the technique you can see that i am injecting fat there where you inject just lateral to the vocal process so you have taken fat there and you, you don't have any special needle you can take a simple 18 gauge scalpel set clip with swing connect it to a 2 cc syringe and start injecting fat you can inject 1 to 1.5 cc fat on one side you can see the left uh, see that the left vocal cord is getting beautifully medialized right see that that is, that that is the medialization this is like a thyroplasty immediately the voice will be improved and uh, see that it is completely medialized the patient will have excellent voice that's a very simple technique only problem is that patient require a general anesthesia so when you expect a recovery but patient cannot afford to have a bad voice for 6 months you can do this kind of procedures it is a day case procedure you can send the patient uh, home uh, next next slide uh, sorry uh, yeah <coughs> yeah there is injecting on the other side same technique i don't think we'll by that now there you can do it as an outpatient procedure too there are many technique under endoscopic control you can inject you can go from the uh, the picture is thyro through the thyrohyoid second picture is through the no no it is, it is not a video uh, through the thyroid and third is through the cricothyroid can you click the third uh, the last one yeah so the assistant will be doing the flexible laryngoscopy you can see the left vocal cord is completely bowed and there is a big phonatory gap Glottis material is hyaluronic acid. You can get uh, the injection material there, either at the name of uh, 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 what is it, uh, Juvederm or Restylane. So it goes subglottically, then go it to the underneath the vocal cord. Now watch the left vocal cord is getting straighter and straighter. That gap is almost completely closing. Uh, finally, 
it is completely straight. You can see that that phonetary gap is gone and patient's uh, voices are almost back to normal. This patient had a cardiorespiratory surgery. He couldn't even uh, cough properly. You can see the needle in, in the subglottis there. Now, see that now it has become completely straightened. So, under visualization, we can inject usually 1 cc, 1 ampule of hyaluronic acid is good enough. Can you click the first slide, first video please? So, this was the patient. He was on oxygen, but he, the problem why he was referred to, no, no, uh, the first one, I lower down. Uh, because he couldn't even cough after the cardiac surgery. No voice. Even if hardly any voice, nothing because and immediately after the injection, 5 minutes later, you can click the next slide. So, mind you, this is just 10 minutes after the injection on the OP, outpatient technique. Only thing is that it, it is going to last only 6 months, then the hyaluronic acid will get absorbed. By the time, hopefully it must recover, otherwise you should do a definitive procedure like thyroplast. Now, the definitive surgical management, established case, 6 months you do the classical medialization thyroplasty. You can see that especially for cases where the phonetary gap is more than 3 millimeter. Uh, when that recovery chance is not there, you can see that I am putting the silastic implant, suitably sized silastic implant into that, that uh, the window cut. Uh, and if there is a significant uh, posterior phonetary gap, you can also, you have to combine another procedure known as the arytenoid rotation, where both vocal cords are vertically at different level. And uh, you can see that. No, go back click on that, click on the first video, yeah. Breathy voice, MPD is very poor, 3 or 4 second only. Okay, next slide, uh, next video you click. Yeah. This is after, no, no, uh, sorry, go back, play on it, second one, yeah. Now the voice is very sharp, excellent MPD. So previously MPD was hardly 4 seconds, you can see that it is going on, on, on. Now, there are, there is a small subgroup where thyroplasty may not be ideal. One is children because you can't do it under local anesthesia. Second is that their larynx is ever growing. And the third is a singer, a professional voice user. Thyroplasty will not retrieve the normal singing voice. And of course, in radiated larynx, it is better not to put an implant. In those cases, unilateral palsy. The best available treatment right now is anastomosing ansa cervicalis to the recurrent laryngeal nerve on that side. Uh, that, that this is the classical picture. You can see that nerve is being anastomosed there, just in front of the vocal, vocal uh, the artery forces. So this was a case on the table. The thyroid surgery was being done. The thyroid, the recurrent laryngeal nerve cut on the side of the tumor. So you anastomose answer to thyro, uh, to the recurrent laryngeal nerve trunk. You don't anastomose recurrent laryngeal nerve to recurrent laryngeal nerve because the chance of synchinesis is very high and patient may develop bad voice. So it is better to do a connect the answer cervicalis to the uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve. Post thyroidectomy unilateral vocal cord palsy. If surgeon is very sure about the integrity of the recurrent laryngeal nerve, he say that I have dissected out the nerve. I am sure there is nothing is wrong, it is anatomically intact, do not worry, just give neurotropics, steroids and give voice therapy. But on the other hand, if a surgeon is not very sure, he did not dissect out the recurrent laryngeal nerve, then immediate re-exploration is indicated. Here you can see that this is the case I re-explored, on the recurrent laryngeal nerve there were two nodes and I had to remove that uh, uh, vicryl nodes because the nerve was actually not cut but it was, uh, it was uh, crushed with the, uh, with the node. So, if the surgeon is not sure about the integrity, anatomical integrity of the nerve, you operate, you re-operate. 
bilateral focal fold movement uh, play this video you can see that you take the history again uh, and the clinical examination video you can see that the vocal cords are not moving glottic space is very 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 little and uh, they can have a lot of problem so established bilateral vocal cord palsy you hope that they will recover maybe in 6 months time so you don't want to do a tracheostomy then you can do a simple surgery known as suture cordopexy play on it you can see that uh, a needle is being passed underneath the vocal cord here through which you pass a proline there so you can see that this is above the vocal cord now uh, you can see a proline is actually coming through it uh, uh, and you pass another needle through it 3 0 proline so it will actually come out through that pull it tighten it and then pull it out through the thyroid cartilage and ligate it so that you can actually see the you can actually easily med lateralize the vocal cord and uh, avoid a tracheostomy you can see that uh, 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 proline is being fed into that and then pull it out so similarly you put in a another tube below also can you play the next slide this is a fine the next one and, uh, yeah. that is a suture codopexy now so I am tying the, uh, the, the suture you can see that the right vocal cord is get left vocal cord is getting totally lateralized so enough airway is there so you can avoid tracheostomy and hope that the vocal cord will recover in due course of time if it is not recovering in 6 months of course you require uh, different surgery now currently the most commonly used treatment for bilateral vocal cord palsy is you can play on that Kashima's posterior cordotomy you can do either with the laser or with the coblator it is a very very predictable surgery excellent result voice is reasonable only problem is it is irreversible you, this is you are here you can see that i am just cutting the uh, left vocal cord in front of the vocal process anteriorly you can see the normal vocal cord and the right side is again normal so you are creating a key, a keyhole shape uh, a space between the vocal cord and enough uh, airway in a very young children you don't do surgery like uh, Kashima or uh, Codapex you can actually do endoscopic that is not a video that is a still you can do endoscopic arytenoidectomy you can see that on the level the second picture you can see there is a big uh, hole there that is actually the arytenoid has been removed because in, in the young children arytenoids are quite bulky and when you remove the arytenoid they heal by secondary intention fibrosis and patient get a very good reasonable airway now very rarely only nowadays you do the external operation which was previously used that is known as the woodman's operation nowadays with the advent of kashima's operation external approach is hardly ever done and it is now resorted to only when there is they are not suitable for endoscopic approach now what are the newer things happening in bilateral vocal cord palsy this is a highly exciting field Harvey Tucker and Roger Crumley were the two people who did lot of research on this they did the nerve muscle transplant phrenic nerve implantation everything and now this is a person who is doing maximum number of cases and I am uh, very happy to be one of his student I went to France to learn his technique so what, what is the current treatment for bilateral vocal cord palsy you know that in Kashima you are actually improving the airway at the expense of the voice but current treatment is that you are retaining both both voice and airway you can see that the posterior cricoarytenoid is uh, connected from the phrenic nerve on one side phrenic is a very powerful abductor nerve because it 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 fire for the the diaphragm to contract and for the adductors you take ansa hypoglossi so there is lot of anastomosis posterior cricoarytenoid is now anastomos from the phrenic nerve on one side using great auricular cable graft and the adductor fiber adductor muscles are innervated from the ansa hypoglossi again using a cable graft uh, this is a very promising thing uh, dr mahari has already done more than uh, 100 cases he has got excellent result more than 80 percent result and uh, one of his student in china has done uh, more than 60 cases they are also good result america they have got now some one center there uh, more than 10 uh, in India we I have done now three cases uh, I'm happy to say that they all are doing reasonably well first case was not that great but we have decanulated everybody so that is the anastomosis 
uh, of uh, phrenic to the multiple anastomosis there is basically it is phrenic to posterior cricoarytenoid and answer to recurrent laryngeal nerve and uh, can you play on the first slide uh, so this uh, this is the uh, first uh, first case second case and third case are actually doing better he is a little relatively older patient the younger patient has got a better result he had lot of paradoxical movement at the height of inspiration the vocal cord got uh, get uh, get see that it is getting and can you play on the other side see that each time the left vocal cord has started moving now normally no no that is a phonation and that is abduction that much of abduction is now happening and uh, he has been decanulated and the second and third the second patient is even better probably hopefully i will be able to show the results much better and this is even more uh, interesting thing this is the corresponding laryngeal corresponding thing of cochlear implant in bilateral vocal cord palsy you can put a pacemaker to the posterior cricoarytenoid and the person on the left side is uh, professor andreas muller the another great man in the field and i had uh, experience to go there and learn this technique uh, in in pig in i think this implant will be marketed in 2019 or 2020 by the medal company who is actually marketing the cochlear implant so this is going to be a breakthrough you are going to put the implant in the posterior cricoarytenoid so each time you are the patient's chest expand it fire and the posterior cricoarytenoid will open up so a very very interesting things are happening in bilateral vocal cord palsy immediate post thyroidectomy vocal cord palsy how do you do as far as possible don't do tracheostomy you can manage almost conservatively if there is a post thyroidectomy bilateral vocal cord palsy put him in the icu put cpap prop the position steroids give oxygen proton pump inhibitor you can also knock off the adductor by giving botox so that there is no adduction and give rest of course in a very difficult case where there is aspiration you may have to do you may have to do tracheostomy and even more uh, exciting finding is this maybe all surgery will go away so there are now new selective neurotropic agents have been described you know that the problem with the recurrent laryngeal nerve is that if the recurrent laryngeal nerve is cut they develop synkinesis that means misdirection of fibers abductor go to adductor adductor go to abductor vice versa and that create a useless vocal cord functioning now we have got selective stimulants so if you inject netrin to the adductor muscle it will attract only the adductor fibers and if you inject glial cell dependent neurotropic factor to the abductor muscle then it will in it will attract only abductor fibers so probably maybe in the future we will not do any surgery we will just inject into the muscle the neurotropic fiber will attract the regeneration of the nerve and all these things may be a, a thing of future this is really unbelievable area previously we thought we were in a tunnel when we were treating bilateral vocal cord palsy hopefully we are seeing light at the end of the tunnel sir we uh, are expecting lot of exciting things we have a lot of questions actually uh, maybe you can answer a few uh, one by dr kranti bhavana uh, uh she is asking it's very very useful need some details about botox use in laryngeal problems what is the role of uh, some details of botox botox is most commonly used in adductor spasmodic dysphonia you have to do use 2.5 units into each thyroarytenoid that means 5 units some patients may require slightly higher dose abductor spasmodic dysphonia you can inject only on one side because if you inject both posterior cricoarytenoid patient will have strider third common indication will be vocal process granuloma which we discussed little early recurrent vocal process granuloma the best treatment available is botox because it knocks off the thyroarytenoid vocal cord become absolutely rested you know there is no hitting against each other and in 3 weeks time the granuloma will be gone and the last indication in 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 laryngology will be cricopharyngeal spasm idiopathic both idiopathic cricopharyngeal spasm as well as cricopharyngeal spasm occurring in lateral medullary syndrome which of course we will be discussing in the next topic so you can give botox and open up the esophagus again so we have uh, one question from dr siti of indonesia 
um she's asking hyaluronic acid will uh, resolve after 1 to 2 years uh, do the patient need injections every 2 years or evaluation of the complaint first hyaluronic acid will not last uh, even 1 year it will last only 6 months so it is injected only for two groups one when you expect a recovery so 6 months later vocal cord will recover second life expectancy of the patient is poor say bronchogenic carcinoma presenting with a vocal cord palsy you cannot take that patient to the theater to do the thyroplasty so you can do hyaluronic acid injection uh, there is another agent that is the hydroxyl apatite paste that is right now not available in india it was earlier uh, by the name uh, restylane that last one and a half years so we have uh, one more uh, question from dr amruta tvs uh, can you please suggest some books for uh, laryngeal lesions neurological uh, and others can you suggest some books there is a book on neurolaryngology by andrew blitzer who is the pioneer in the treatment of adductor spasmodic dystonia so neurological disorders of the larynx that is the name but of course you get lot of books i think uh, the most comprehensive book will be La- larynx a comprehensive uh, uh, sorry larynx a, a, com- a comprehensive approach by marvin p fried f r i e d then of course there is a book on larynx by robert ossoff there are a lot of books and uh, we have a question from uh, meenakshi sundaram good evening sir there is there a role of mitomycin injection for laryngeal problems yeah mitomycin can be applied where the cartilage is exposed whether it is cricoid whether it is thyroid whether it is arytenoid so to prevent granuloma but i should say that there are no proven studies no controlled studies saying that mitomycin prevent uh, granuloma but there is no harm in done it is not very expensive i definitely use when the cartilage is exposed in the larynx either thyroid or cricoid arytenoid i use uh, 2% mitomycin for 2 minutes So uh, there is one more question by Dr. Rajendra and Dinesh Kumar. Is there any role for platelet rich fibrin for injection thyroplasty medialization sir? To my knowledge no uh, because uh, most of the injection uh, are either by the, uh, by the hydroxyl apatite and hyaluronic acid. So uh, I am just asking a personal question from my side. Do you still do Kashima surgery or not? Yeah, yeah, I actually give the option to the patient because Kashima, I will tell that this is a very quick operation, very predictable operation. The uh, only problem is that your voice will be a little bit weak. It is less expensive. I will tell that I have started doing regeneration, re-implantation. I have got a uh, uh, reasonable good result. But this will cost roughly three to four times uh, the bill, longer stay. First two weeks, patient will have both tracheostomy. Even if they don't have a tracheostomy at present, they will have a tracheostomy and they will have rails tube feeding for 10 days. So, I will give, explain everything. If patient is comfortable, I will take for the generation. So, I think, uh, again, I just want to tell some statistical numbers. Uh, 11,937 people are watching it. That is uh, something like uh, 12,000 people means... Uh, Unbelievable. Unbelievable reach of this. Uh, I should really thank Alambic uh, for uh, starting this program. And uh, it's going to continue. Next week, I'm going to talk on endo- basics of endoscopic uh, sinus surgery and also some clinical uh, cases. Uh, I'm sure it will be very interesting. The other legends uh, who are going to uh, definitely visit our center are, uh, we have asked dates from Professor Mohan Kameshwaran, Padma Shri Mohan Kameshwaran. and then uh, professor sultan pradhan of uh, tata memorial hospital dr vikas agarwal from bombay and uh, and so many are going to come here and you are all going to enjoy saturday evenings with all these legends now over to the next topic by dr jaykumar menon sir this is going to be uh, management of neurological dysphagia and uh, he is a master in it and you are going to see how much of command he has on this subject over to you sir <clears throat> laryngology has been developing uh, quite at a breakneck speed and uh, obviously it has been branching too so there are three major branches already the voice or the phono surgery the airway tract stenosis uh, for the laryngotracheal uh, stenosis and deglutology or the speciality of dysphagia management now uh, this has been a major problem lots and lots of patient all over the world has got dysphagia especially from the cancer head and neck cancer surgery 
and also from the neurology and neurosurgical wards. And our understanding of the swallowing was not very great. Even now it is not very great. But I am happy to tell that among the three subspecialities of the laryngology, dysphagia is improving by leaps and bounds every year. It is one of the top speciality. Many people in America are just concentrating on dysphagia alone because it is hard regarding speciality. And uh, so, I have got, uh, so I have got actually a dysphagia unit in Amrata Cochin. So, I am a visiting consultant there. I'm, I, I actually do only swallowing there in, in Amrata. In Kims, I do all the three branches of the laryngology. Now, neurological dysphagia. I think I, I am sure that every one of you know there are the different stages. The oral stages has got the oral and preparatory and the oral proper. And the, you can play on that video. And the pharyngeal and uh, esophageal stages are there. It, in a new, most of the neurological dysphagia, you actually get uh, the problems are either in the oral stage or in the pharyngeal stage. So this is a classical video fluoroscopy showing the picture, you know, how the, the bolus is going. Fluoroscopy is a very important tool in assessing the swallowing mechanism. Now, what are the common causes of neurological causes? So, we are not taking into consideration the head and neck cancer at all. So, that is a major group. So, the major common causes of neurological causes of swallowing is one is the brain stem stroke or the lateral medullary syndrome or otherwise known as the Wallenberg syndrome. Many times, they will have only one complaint, swallowing. They are otherwise okay. They don't have any, any limb movement or any problem. They will just wake up one day, woke up, wake up one day saying that I cannot swallow anything. So that can present like that. Motor neuron disease is a very difficult condition, very frustrating condition. Uh, you, uh, treatment is very, very difficult. Parkinsonism is the condition which can affect all the stages of swallowing. And of course, many neurosurgical procedures, especially of the posterior cranial fossa like foramen magnum decompression, Arnold Chiari malformation surgery, uh, um, the acoustic neuroma surgery, they all can actually create problem with the swallowing. Now, this is a huge topic, so I will try to make as simple as that. So, I believe that any complex topic should be oversimplified, then only uh, it is easy to understand. So, this is a very complex topic. So, I am just going to uh, make you understand this way. All group of swallowing patient can be put under three major headings. Either you treat with indirect swallowing therapy or direct swallowing therapy or interventional therapy. Means you do surgery. Now, uh, if you can call the surgery is done to improve the voice phonosurgery, there is no reason why these surgeries can be called phago surgery. This is my own uh, creation. Uh, so, I, I, I have written it in few textbooks this word. Because there are a group of surgeries which are de designed to improve the swallowing. So, any surgery done to retrieve or improve the swallowing can be called phago surgery. So, we will see what are these conditions, what is indirect swallowing therapy, what is direct swallowing therapy and what is interventional therapy. Now, uh, going back, uh, be before going to each and everyone, indirect swallowing therapy means you actually do not give food to the patient but you design certain exercises where you strengthen the already weakened muscle. I will show more and more examples so you will understand. So, indirect swallowing therapy means you won't give food to the patient. You will just yes, strengthen the muscle. Say for example, patient has got a palatal palsy, patient has got nasal regurgitation. So, what is the indirect swallowing therapy? You design certain exercises where the palate muscle will become strengthened like blowing a balloon. So, that is an indirect swallowing therapy. What is direct swallowing therapy? You give food, but you modify it. You don't give a standard. You modify it in different way. You may modify its texture. You may modify its temperature. You may modify its volume. You may modify the position in which the patient has to swallow. You may tell the techniques to swallow when patient has got cough or something like that. And interventional therapy is a surgery. So, with this basic understanding, we will just run through few of the neurological condition and how you can see or uh, help them. Now, imagine patient has got an oral preparatory phase problem. This patient had a, a skull base surgery in Bangalore and uh, you can see that uh, 
her uh, right uh, facial palsy is there. So, what is the problem? She has got a cap. The, the, the lips are not closing thoroughly. So, a patient cannot really swallow and vaccinator is paralyzed. So, whatever will happen? The food will always get collected in the oral vestibule. So, two problems she will have. She will have problem the food will drool out and the food bolus will get collected in the vestibule. Can you uh, uh, click on the x-ray? Not on the picture. Yeah. Yeah, you can see that, see that there is no lip seal, you can see the barium is actually coming out and even after swallowing, there is a lot of barium in the oral cavity. That is in the vestibule because the vaccinator is paralyzed, so vaccinator cannot actually send the food back to the oral cavity proper. So that is very, very common condition. So how do you treat them? So, we have seen that indirect swallowing therapy. We know that the patient has, mind you, these most of the swallowing therapy techniques are very simple techniques. All of you can follow. If you understand it properly, the pathophysiology. So, imagine patient has got a lip weakness. What you will do? You do a lip strengthening exercise. So, one of the commonest simple lip strengthening exercise is known as the button and thread exercise. You take a very big button anchor it very strongly to a twine, keep the button inside the lip but outside the teeth and ask the child or the patient to hold on to the button with their lips and at the same time the caregiver will be pulling at the twine so that you are actually developing muscle tone. This is a very efficient technique, gradually the length power will come and what will be the direct swallowing therapy technique for this patient? Suppose the right side is paralyzed, very simple. You give the foot through the left side of the mouth or ask the patient to turn the head to the left. So, that with the gravity, food will go only to the left side. So, on the side of facial palsy, the food will not get collected. Very simple technique. What is the surgical treatment? Phago surgery, you do the masseter transfer or the temporalis transfer. So, each and every condition will have indirect swallowing therapy, direct swallowing therapy, surgical therapy. So, direct swallowing therapy will be, affect, you can, can you uh, play that, uh, uh, you avoid the, uh, the abnormal side, feed it through the, the normal side and also you can tilt, whatever way, whichever way it prevent, uh, so they all are very, very simple common sense technique, most of the swallowing therapy technique, if you understand the mechanism, it is much easier to treat. You have to understand the physiology, the pathophysiology you have to understand. Now, oral preparatory phase, that means uh, again we will see, uh, another facial palsy case, can you play on the video? See, you can see that there is plenty of uh, bolus in the left vestibule. This is the vaccinator paralysis, you can see that uh, uh, even after the tongue has propelled the mass into the oral pharynx, there is plenty of uh, barium still in the oral cavity. Since it is in the lateral view, you can't understand. But if it is in the AP view, you can see it is clearly outside the teeth. But here you can see that the barium is still there. That is a classical vaccinator paralysis. So how you manage? Indirect swallowing therapy will be muscle strengthening. Ask the patient to blow. So the vaccinator will strengthen it. What is a direct swallowing therapy? Again, avoid the side. It go to the normal side, it is very easy. Now, you can have inability to chew, can you play? In a fifth cranial nerve palsy, you can actually have a lot of problem like, you know, the mandible will not be chewing properly, so they can have a lot of other problem, we will come to that, I think we will skip that. So, what you do? You give blended diet. So, this is what is known as the modification of the diet. Some patient will require some kind of food. So, in, in swallowing therapy, in direct swallowing therapy, you have to modify the diet, you have to modify the amount. Some people cannot take 30 ml of water at a stretch, they have to take 5 ml each, but they still be able to drink. A, a, a patient who has got a narrowing will not be able to take solid food, you have to give liquid. A patient who has got a vocal cord paralysis will not be able to take liquid food, you have to give them semi-solid, so adjust that way. Now, Bolus propulsion is poor. Some patient has got a tongue paralysis. This was a patient who underwent Arnold Chiari malformation surgery. Play on it. You can see that it's a bilateral hypoglossal palsy. Very unfortunate condition. Patient cannot 
not uh, send the food into the uh, oropharynx proper at all. So patient is struggling there, the food is entirely in the oral cavity. What do you do? What is the indirect swallowing therapy? Do the tongue muscle exercise, keep on doing, apply heat, some honey on the lip, ask the patient to try to lick around, both clockwise and anticlockwise. So keep on stimulating the tongue, stretching the tongue will move. What is the direct swallowing therapy? Provided patient's laryngeal stage is normal, you can actually bypass. Click the second video. See, patient has got a tongue paralysis, patient is unable to get. So, what this is known as the jet feeding. You take a polythene cannula, make semi solid diet, and put there into the pharynx and put it. That is as simple as that. Patient swallow. Mind you, Posterior pharyngeal wall and palate has got taste buds. So patient is not just having a tube feed. Patient is enjoying the taste of the food. Patient is avoiding a feed. So this is the jet feed. You bypass. this all. That is what I tell. All swallowing therapy techniques are common sense technique. It is pure basic common sense. How you can go about. That is a wonderful concept. And you can also use gravity. Click the first slide. If the tongue is not propelling, what will you do? You ask the patient to lift the head so that the tongue will act like an inclined plane over which the fluid will flow over it. You cannot give solid, but you can always give liquid. Now, sometimes it, uh, uh, tongue, uh, Parkinsonism can be a very, very difficult condition. Can you click on that? This is known as the swing movement of the, uh, the tongue. First, the anterior part of the tongue will rise in the oral cavity, then the posterior cavity. Unfortunately, the foot will move like a swing from to and fro. So, it is an incoordinate movement of the tongue. It is a very difficult condition in tongue, in Parkinsonism, the tongue is keeping on moving. So, what you can do, what is known as effortful swallow, what you do is patient, ask the patient to squeeze it down. You can see that the whole larynx gets squeezed, pharynx open up, this, this is known as the effortful swallow. Now, velopharyngeal incompetence, where patient has got a lot of uh, nasal regurgitation. Here you can see that into the nasopharynx also is the barium going up. Uh, how you go about it? So, the patient has got tongue palsy as well as a palatal palsy. Again, do the palatal exercise, the indirect swallowing therapy. What will be the direct swallowing therapy? Again, a very simple technique like nose pinching or chin tuck. First, first video, please. Watch this massive uh, leak through the nose. That is huge. But now, watch it. Make her eat normally. So, when you pinch the nose, there is a back pressure, and many times it will actually prevent. And so next uh, video, click on. You can see this is chin tuck. When you Chin, when you flex the chin because of the fulcrum effect, the soft palate go and touch the posterior pharyngeal wall better. So many of the nasal regurgitation will be prevented if you ask the patient to swallow in, in head down position. Ask the patient to touch the neck, uh, sorry, the anterior chest wall with their chin. So th that is known as the chin tuck. So you can uh, see that nasopharynx get completely cut off and you can actually swallow much better. Suppose still it does not work, there is an operation called palatopexy. So here you can see that the on the, on the left hand side is a soft palate and on the right hand side you have seen that I have taken both posterior pillar as a superiorly based flap and rotated across the posterior pharyngeal wall so that the velopharyngeal sphincter has become very very small. They may snore little bit but their nasal regurgitation will come down significantly. Now, laryngopharyngeal paralysis can be a very, very difficult condition. You know that the basic condition in swallowing is that the larynx has to elevate. You watch the patient when they swallow, the larynx has to elevate. If the larynx is not elevating, you call it laryngopharyngeal paralysis. This can happen in motor neuron disease as well as in diseases of the mandible where you have resected the symphysis mende. They can be very difficult condition, one of the most difficult condition in, in swallowing disorder patient uh, can have real swallowing problem. Can you click on the next video please? Next video, next video. Yeah, the patient is attempting to swallow but uh, it is not going really. The larynx is not elevating. This is one of the worst prognostic condition in, in the swallowing. If the larynx is not elevating, 
the swallowing will not be very great. So, that what you can do? So, indirect therapy is what is known as the shaker exercise after the famous gastroenterologist who invented the, no go back, uh, invented the, uh, the transnasal esophagoscope Rasa shaker. So, he described this technique, uh, ask the patient, click on that, ask the patient to lie down flat and lift the head off the, off the bed against the gravity, try to keep it as long as they can. So, what will happen? The suprahyoid musculature will get strengthened and strengthened, every day they do it. So, when the suprahyoid musculature gets strengthened, laryngeal elevation become better. You can do what is known as the Mendelssohn's maneuver, that is a direct swallowing therapy. So, if the larynx is not going by, no go back, going by its own, keep the food in the mouth, you catch hold of the larynx and elevate. And you can also do the chin tuck, uh, because when you tuck the chin, you stretch the cricopharynx and it open up. Watch this patient, he, he was struggling. Now, with the cricopharynx, uh, with the chin tuck, watch the barium flowing almost normally. You can see that. See that, that almost normal even, because when you stretch the cricopharynx, cricopharynx open. So, if the patient's larynx is not elevating, one second option is chin tuck. You have seen that chin tuck is also useful for velopharyngeal incompetence. Hyodapexy is many times done by the snoring surgeon, but uh, our surgery, the swallowing surgeon, the deglutologist do in a different way. Here you do both thyroid you are the you anger the hyo to the mandible in the first picture you can see i have taken the proline suture and in the second picture you can see that you have also obliterated the thyrohyoid space so you obliterate the thyrohyoid space by angering the thyroid and hyo together and then anger the hyo uh, to the mandible so that larynx is permanently in a higher position under the protection of the tongue base and also when you are elevating the larynx it causes cricopharynx to relax because cricopharynx is always in a contracted state. It will open only if it is stretched. And if larynx is not elevating, cricopharynx won't open up. That is the problem with the laryngopharyngeal paralysis. So, in difficult cases, you can go for hyodapexy. Sir, uh, we have a few questions. Uh, I think we can answer them. Uh, R.K. Ja, Dr. R.K. Ja is asking me, uh, asking us, how to diagnose functional aphonia? That is a question now. Okay, uh, shall I go about? Yeah, but functional aphonia means vocal cords are normal and patient does not produce any voice at all, absolutely no voice. But you ask the patient to cough, he will cough. Vocal cord is in a way like liver. You can take out 90 percent of the vocal cord, you still have some voice. So, if somebody is just producing absolutely no voice, you should suspect that you are dealing with a functional aphonia. Yeah, even if only 10 percent of the vocal cord is there, there will be some rough voice. So, that is one indicator. Second is that they will be able to cough normally. Thank you, sir. You can continue, please. Now, pharyngeal dysphagia, you can have laryngeal incompetence where the vocal cord is paralyzed. Can you click on the first video? It's not playing. Oh, just click on that. Just click on that. Okay. You can see that uh, the right vocal cord is immobile and there is a lot of pooling and gradually the saliva in the piriform fossa is going into the larynx. So, this happened in a 10th cranial nerve palsy, you can uh, play the next video and the fluoroscopy show massive aspiration. It is not playing, can you play this? Go back to the, okay, I will okay, come back. Now play that uh, video, now play the second video. Okay, leave it, that was an aspiration. So, if there is an aspiration, what you can do? Now, this is not, there are two techniques. One is known as the supraglottic swallowing, second is known as the super supraglottic swallowing. What are they? It is very simple technique, they are very efficient. Suppose patient's one larynx, hemilarynx is not closing and patient is aspirating on liquid. In supraglottic swallowing, what you do is, you keep the food in the mouth, ask the patient to hold breath and swallow and he should not release the breath till he is uh, completed. Can you click on that? So, this is a supraglottic and no, wait, wait, it will play. No, no, one minute, one minute. Oh, sorry, what happened? I now play on that. 
Oh, it's okay. No, next one. You can play on the next one. There is some video. Okay, I will tell what exactly in, in super supraglottic swallowing technique. What is happening is that not only you will hold the breath, but also you will do the bearing down maneuver. Or this is Jandrasik maneuver. Ask the patient to hold it tight and keep on tightening and do hold the breath also. Yeah, hold the breath tightly and then swallow. Now, you can see the lower picture, their picture, they are not video. Look at the middle picture where both vocal cords are not closing. Now, look at the left hand side picture. This is the what happens when you do the supraglottic maneuver. See, the arytenoids are coming closer to each other and it is almost coming to epiglottis. So, this is a supraglottic and see on the right side, super supraglottic, it gets completely close you know the fire the larynx get totally close epiglottis get jam against the posterior pharyngeal wall so the chance of uh, aspiration is hardly anything can you click on the first video this is a supracricoid partial laryngectomy had massive aspiration huge aspiration see that 50 percent go to through the front root that is the larynx so teach him the super super supraglottic swallowing technique watch the next video First, he did in land, he, is, he had aspiration, but a little later, you can see that. Now, this is his first attempt at, at the super supraglottic. That was not successful. He didn't land it. Now, see that. See that? He, he could actually control the uh, thing and totally uh, prevent the aspiration. So, it's a very efficient technique, uh, excellent technique to prevent the aspiration. Now, sometimes neither supraglottic or super supraglottic can prevent then you can do actually type 1 thyroplasty and direct no rotation so uh, originally which is a phono surgery here comes back as a phago surgery now watch this patient uh, can you go a little forward on that uh, slide so that no no on that slide on that video same video click li go a little forward a little more forward yeah now he is trying to you know little backward little backward little backward yeah there 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 you know uh. yeah he is trying to drink liquid watch he has got a unilateral vocal cord palsy with superior lingibus it went in immediately came back he aspirated he cannot now can you click on the next video that is the after thyroplasty no video click on the video Now, you can see that the, the tube is gone, he has got occasional mild cough, but he is drinking thin liquid. Now, if a patient has got a unilateral vocal cord laryngeal incompetence, if he is drinking thin liquid, that is the end of the therapy, because that is the most difficult thing to drink. Solid will not leak, liquid uh, will, will easily leak. So, thyroplasty can be very useful at that time. And sometimes, you may have to do cough tracheostomy. And in very rare cases where the aspiration is intractable, I prefer to do this surgery. This is known as the laryngotracheal separation or disjunction. You separate the larynx and the trachea and close down the lower end of the larynx so that nothing goes down and bring the upper end of the trachea as the tracheostomy. If and when the aspiration problem uh, come back, patient is okay, you can do the reanastomosis. But reanastomosis is a little bit difficult procedure, only people who do real. A regular tracheal resection can do this surgery because you have to do just like a tracheal resection you have to anastomose again so we have a uh, few uh, uh, comments and questions i uh, just want to uh, inform that we are being seen by 15620 people 15620 <laughs> people which are uh, who have been really reached. gratifying i am happy to know that people are uh, listening yeah and a uh, person called sanjit mishra has written sitting glued to my mobile screen without a blink <laughs> okay, okay, now a question from Dr. Nandini, uh, sudden hiccups, uh, this is very common, sudden hiccups while swallowing food even after drinking water. So, this is something which uh, everybody wants to ask you. I, you, we... I, I also uh, probably cannot have a very definite answer, but one of the cause of uh, that kind of uh, thing is that obviously this is irritation of the diaphragm. We all know that uh, the hiccup is actually due to the irritation of the diaphragm get irritated. So, how the diaphragm get irritated? Either the phrenic has to get irritated, that is very unlikely. So, usually what happens is that 
some amount of an air bolus gets stuck in the in the stomach fundus and it keep on irritating the uh, uh, to, to, to the fundus. So, it stimulate the, the, the diaphragm and keep on doing that. So, positioning, drinking water all may be okay, but probably many times a simple treatment like gelusal MPS which is a methyl polysilioxane which is a known anti flatulent you know that the air antagonist will actually uh, cure. You can also give a domperidone like uh, uh, prokinetic agents. So, we have uh, Arun Nair asking about the future of laryngeal transplants. Laryngeal transplant uh, is already in the vogue, uh, only problem is that the ideal cases are as of now very few because the commonest cause of laryngectomy is cancer and you do not do laryngeal transplant in a cancer because you have to give an immunosuppressant, you will not give an immunosuppressant in a cancer. So, right now the indication for laryngeal transplant is a young patient who has lost his larynx in a trauma and mind you all the three functions of the larynx has to go because both airway, voice and swallowing then if there is the ideal donor you can do that surgery. So, you can continue professor. Now, uh, pharyngeal paralysis uh, if there is no squeezing effect suppose patient has this patient has got a hypoglossal paralysis sorry pharyngeal paralysis on the right side after a schwannoma operation and uh, a simple technique of avoiding the right side turning the head tilting the head to the left you can see that with the gravity when patient is shifting the gravity simply because of the gravity whole fluid go through the left side. So, there is no chance of fluid getting, uh, going through the paralyzed pharyngeal uh, pyriform fossa and then goes in secondary aspiration that is very simple technique next slide next uh, you click on that. This is the effect of turning the head watch this patient is lying down on the right side on his right side. And patient is when patient is uh, lying on the right side, right. So in a right sided position, you can see that whole food went through the right piriform for soul. You can see that colored fluid going there. So this is a very efficient technique. Suppose patient has got a left pharyngeal paralysis. Of course, this patient doesn't have a paralysis. It's only a demonstration. Can you play that video once again? The second video. So, if you want to avoid one pyriform fossa, just ask the patient lie on the opposite side. You can see that now the whole colored fluid was going only through the right side because patient was lying on the right side. That is a very simple technique. So, if there is a left pyriform fossa paralysis, ask the patient to lie down. Here the patient is lying on the right side. So, whole food will go only through the right side. That is a very simple technique of avoiding aspiration. Now, this is very interesting note what will happen when you turn your head this is a still picture watch the middle picture you can see both pyriform fossa are open you can see it. now on the left hand side patient has turned the head to the right side see that what has happened right pyriform fossa has got completely obliterated and left pyriform fossa became much open and see on the other side right hand corner patient has turned the head to the left and what has happened? Left pyriform fossa got obliterated and right pyriform fossa became open. So, this is a very useful technique. Whenever you want to open up one pyriform fossa or you want to close a paralyzed pyriform fossa, you can judiciously turn the head and this can be done with visual feedback. You can even show the patient, put the flexible laryngoscope, put him in front of the mirror, ask him to turn and see that look now you are going through the right side. So, this is the video uh, 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 evidenced swallowing therapy technique. Now, if one pyriform fossa is hopelessly paralyzed, there is plenty of pooling. There is a simple surgery known as obliteration of the pyriform fossa or hypopharyngoplasty. Anybody who does uh, thyroplasty and retinal rotation can actually do that. Any, you can see on the right side, there is a bulge, a bubble like thing in the middle of the picture. That is a pyriform fossa. It, mind you, this is done under local anesthesia. When you swallow, you see the pyriform fossa bulging. Just plicate like a hernia. You just close it off with, uh, with the proline so that the funnel shaped pyriform fossa become semi funnel shaped. Paralyzed pyriform fossa get completely obliterated. So, there won't be any pooling and there won't be any secondary aspiration. Now, you can have cricopharyngeal dysmotility, which is very common in brainstem stroke and sometimes in idiopathic uh, condition also. Watch this case, this is a lateral medullary syndrome, 
patient is trying to swallow, the cricopharynx is not opening up. It is simply staying there and after some time it actually folds back into the larynx. So, patient can have a delayed cough that's, that is that's a very difficult condition. If it does not clear in 6 weeks time in, in lateral medullary syndrome, you need to intervene. Can you click the next? Uh, this is an idiopathic cricopharyngeal spasm. Uh, happen in older people, especially ladies. Uh, in the lower part of the video, you can see big indentation of the posterior pharyngeal wall of the for the, uh, the esophagus. You can see that is the idiopathic cricopharyngeal spasm. This happen in many may, uh, middle aged, uh, 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 that is after myotomy. You can see it is going very well. We will come to that. Next slide. Sorry. Now, the first treatment will be Botox. You can inject under uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, electromyographic control and you saw the first patient where the cricopharynx was not opening. The same patient below, can you click that video, below video, first video, below, below, ah, yeah. The same patient who was not opening up at all, 18 days after injection, you can see that uh, bolus is going normally, patient is swallowing normally. So, Botox can do wonders in uh, lateral medullary syndrome early stage. Can you click that uh, surgical video, the red one, the red one. That is a cricopharyngeal myotomy. So, if Botox is not working and it is a long standing case, you can actually open up the neck. That is the esophageal mucosa. You do not uh, breach the mucosa, but you cut the entire cricopharyngeal muscle. And mind you, cricopharyngeal is not just confined to cricoid. To be a successful cricopharyngeal myotomy, you have to cut the muscle all the way down to the clavicle because there is a lot of interlacing fibers with the esophagus. So, to be a successful cricopharyngeal myotomy, you have to cut not only the cricopharyngeus but also the upper esophageal fiber. Now, click the last video. This was a patient who had medullary carcinoma surgery and after radiation patient had severe uh, uh, and, uh, obstruction, it was very difficult. But, uh, sorry, the, uh, this, this is a cricopharyngeal, same patient, yeah, you can see that that big cricopharyngeal spasm and after cricopharyngeal myotomy, you can see that patient is uh, swallowing much, much better. Now, uh, we are about uh, the end of this uh, today's program. What is cortical stroke? You know that uh, you will see many patients with the middle cerebral artery uh, uh, stroke. The, the neurologist will say that patient has got a middle cerebral artery stroke, patient is not swallowing. Actually, cortex has nothing to with, do with the swallowing. Swallowing technique is intact, but patient simply won't swallow. This is known as swallowing apraxia or swallowing agnosia. Apraxia means patient does not know the food is for swallowing. So, he simply won't swallow. He will put the food in the mouth. His swallowing technique is perfect. He won't aspirate, but he won't swallow. And what is swallowing agnosia? He does not even know that food is in the mouth. They can be very difficult condition. It occur in middle cerebral artery stroke. It is worse on the left side. If it is a left middle cerebral artery stroke, these chances are high. Right side, younger patient, left side many times take over and they have got good response. So, even though their swallowing technique is, mechanism is perfectly all right, there is no risk of aspiration pneumonia, they will still require some kind of uh, a tube feeling. So, uh, the ability to enjoy food is one of the most primary requirement. That is why deglutology is one of the most gratifying speciality in END. Because I know that as a laryngologist, I have retrieved the voice of many people. They are very, very thankful to you. But it is nothing when compared to the patient's gratitude in whom you have retrieved the ability to eat and drink just like a normal person. If you can't eat and drink, then what is the point in, in living? So, that's a very exhaustive uh, uh, three uh, lectures. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jai Kumar, sir. Thank you. Uh, in fact, uh, we have a lot of questions. Dr. Sambaji uh, Chintale has asked, uh, uh, what is the treatment for globus pharyngeus? First of all, you have to make sure that you are not missing anything. So, globus, 5% of the lower esophageal pathology can actually present as globus. So, before branding them globus, do a thorough examination, do a flexible laryngoscopy and if in doubt, you do a esophagoscopy. If you have got the facility to do the esophagoscopy yourself like transnasal esophagoscopy, great. 
otherwise you ask your surgical gastro or medical gastro colleague to do the esophagoscopy if they are all right then you can treat globus with uh, pandoprazole and sometimes you may have to do an antipepsin agent too and many time reassurance will be okay and you have to change the lifestyle measures so uh, re we re we all really thank actually uh, it's an unbelievable response of 16955 people who have been reached by this program from around 20 uh, 17 or 18 countries we don't know tomorrow we'll give you the list exact list of how many countries have been reached around 16 to 17 countries have been reached and uh, this is just the start uh, you you have seen the real doin you know how nicely you all enjoyed uh, his uh, lectures uh, in fact uh, the next week what we are planning is uh, i am going to talk on basics of endoscopic sinus surgery and it's going to be a two day program so uh, initially on a saturday evening you'll be having a lecture for around 2 hours uh, that is uh, some videos on cadaver demonstration as well as some uh, clinical videos on basics of endoscopic sinus surgery we'll discuss all the questions like we did today and then the next day will be a live surgical demonstration of a few uh, fest cases uh, on sunday and uh, that is uh, the program for the next week i'm sure you will all join us for next week uh, this week in fact uh, dr jaykumar sir is going to operate on a few cases but unfortunately we didn't plan for transmission uh, maybe we will uh, um, uh, plan for it later in we have uh, contacted legends like uh, professor sultan pradhan dr uh, vikas agarwal and also uh, professor padmashri mohan kameshwaran sir and we'll all be um, uh, seeing them on saturday evenings uh, really really thank uh, alambic uh, mr rajit and also the whole team who is right here the whole team in trichy uh, for this wonderful program and the reach which they have created for this and the expectation for a saturday night and uh, this is truly unbelievable and this is the way to go i believe uh, the method of teaching and there are so many postgraduates who will benefit from this and uh, i really really thank you sir for coming over to trichy and uh, uh, and uh, i would like to just uh, end this by asking you just a question uh, i think i feel totally out outdated uh, after seeing your talk on laryngology uh, so what is your advice to uh, the youngsters out there the postgraduates who want to start a career in laryngology yeah i think uh, just like any other specialty end is also developing very very fast and i always believe that there are in any specialty there are three levels one is the generalist that means you do everything so in the beginning you, you a stage of your career you have to do that you have to do town you have to do throat you have to do nose you have to do ear because then only you will know the apt attitude and you, know, you will have the aptitude then the next stage is you have to upgrade it to the level 2 that is the generalist with special interest because you you may select laryngology but in the beginning you cannot survive on laryngology alone so what you are doing you are going to do general uh, end alone also but mind you you will concentrate on laryngology or whatever otology if it is and you will publish and present paper only on laryngology that is very important if you talk about otology today rhinology tomorrow head and neck surgery day after tomorrow nobody is going to take you seriously but if you keep on talking on one thing people will know that okay you are there so that is the english level you are going to level 2 generalist with special interest now the last level is a super specialist that is optional if you want you can become a super specialist like what i have done i and i don't do ear and nose but it's up to you so society need all the three the village the rural area require the generalist the bigger towns require the generalist with the special interest and the higher referral center certainly require the uh, the super specialist so by the time you have got enough time to develop specialty so you are not under pressure to earn you know if you take a specialty if you tell that i am going to practice laryngology tomorrow you will struggle because you won't get enough case so that is how you should be going so thank you very much sir i think uh, the youngsters really enjoyed that final answer of yours so level 1 level 2 and level 3 and uh, just want to advise uh, those of you who really want to choose the level 3 uh, or the level 2 that uh, the most important thing is project yourself in one field Excellent. or else you will not be equated to that particular area 
and uh, that is very important don't uh, project yourself as a rhinologist as a otologist as a uh, implantologist and everything so that will lead you nowhere in this world because the world is moving towards the highest focus in every field Excellent. thank you very much and uh, have a very good night thank you good night good unbelievable 16